So let's give a really friendly welcome, Hazel McCullum. <laughs> Who has just a little bit of stress in their life? A lot? Yeah? Stress seems to be on the increase, doesn't it? But I don't know about you, but I think we've taken a perfectly normal physical reaction to a threat. And I think we've demonized threat. I think we talk about it as if it's something out there, something external to us, something out of our control. It's like it's a predator stalking us, sucking away our life, sucking away our happiness. And I think we've given stress a lot more power than it should have. But what if there was a different way to think about stress? What if we could think differently about stress? I did this a few years ago when I had so much stress in my life that I silently but spectacularly hit the wall. And I had to rethink my habits, my behaviors, the way I thought and the way I managed stress. And the research and the experience of that time made me change my mind about stress. And this evening, I'd like to change yours. Now, why is this important? Well, let me just tell you quickly about a study in the States. In 1998, some researchers took 30,000 people and they asked them two questions. The first one, how much stress have you had in your life in the previous year? And they scored it. And the second one was, do you think stress is harmful? And can you manage stress? And then they tracked the public death records over eight years to see who had died prematurely from stress-related illness. The bad news is the people that had had a lot of stress in the, pre the year previous to the study had a 43% increase in dying prematurely from stress-related illness. But it wasn't true for everyone. The people that didn't think stress was harmful and thought they could manage their stress had no more risk of dying even if they'd had a lot of stress in the previous year. So can changing your mind about stress make you healthier? Well, the science says, yes, it does. How you think about stress really matters. So my aim now is not to get rid of your stress. It's to help you get better at stress. So how do you do this? Well, it's a bit of a journey, but I'm going to give you three tips tonight to set you off on the proper road. So the first thing Really recognize how stress turns up for you. How do you act? How do you feel when you're stressed? You can't change what you can't see. Have you ever bowled a frog? <laughs> no? Sure. <laughs> Must be a Welsh thing. You know, <laughs> if you take a frog and you drop it in boiling water, it will jump straight up because it detects the danger. But if you take that same frog, and you put him in cold water, and you turn up the heat, he'll stay there till he boils. And that's what we're like under stress. We think we're coping, we think we're managing it, but we're not. Our body, bodies are adjusting all the time, and it will get to the point where, like me, if you don't manage your stress, you'll hit the wall, or like Ariana Huffington describes, you'll end up bruised and bloodied on the kitchen floor. So get to know your stress. The second thing is control. Just be realistic about how much you can control in your life. I guarantee, and I would put money on it, that most, if not all of the things you stress and worry about are totally outside of your control. We like to think we can control things, but there's very little we can control. So be realistic about it. And instead of spending all your time and energy on those things that you can't control, spend it instead on learning to let go of them and on controlling the one thing that you can, which is you, what goes on under your bonnet, your thoughts, your behaviors, your habits, your actions. Only you can do this. And the third thing is take responsibility. You know, we, we often give the blame away to other people for making us feel in a certain way. Nobody can make you happy. Nobody can make you sad. Nobody can make you stressed. We are always choosing now, you're not responsible for things that happen to you, obviously. Ugly things happen, catastrophes happen to us, and they're not your responsibility. But what you are responsible for is your response to them. So choose your response. Become aware that you can choose your response and choose a more helpful response. So to, so to sum up, if you want to get better at stress, recognize what stress is like for you and what your triggers are. Be realistic about the amount of control you have in your life, but control the thing you really can. 
and take responsibility. And if you start doing these three things straight away, you will be taking a very big step on your journey to getting better at stress. And if you can get better at stress, you can cope with more or less whatever life throws at you. Wait a minute. <laughs> I have to come up with some witty remark about stress, which I can't do in, under that stress. <laughs> Feedback, please. Gee, that was stressful. Okay. Good. Really good. I, I, for some reason, I don't know, everyone's standing still today. Like, ah. No one's moving. <laughs> they have a big stage here. Um, but really, your content's very good. I know uh, I, I gave you some feedback in the group. I, I think in terms of a stretch and how to make that even more powerful is to dial back to that day and start with a story. So you talked about coping brilliantly, silently. Take us to that day of when you realized that you were crumbling. Yeah. I woke up and I don't know your story, but you know, I woke up and I realized everything had fallen apart. The room was a mess. I was wearing odd socks. I was putting my trousers on my head. I was a mess. And that was when I realized something had to change. Let me talk to you a little bit about stress. So you can really enroll us, hook us, yeah. to the use of a story. Uh, it doesn't even have to be used, a metaphoric story, and then go into it. The academic stuff is brilliant. I love the, you know, the whole stats you brought in that brings it home. And I just feel to, to weave it together, if we could have more of you personal journey or a personal journey, then we can sit. Because we're overloaded with information, aren't we? We've got all this information coming at us. But if we can put ourselves in your shoes, and that's what happens through storytelling, then it's a lot more memorable. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd really think the stretch for you is to storify that information, make it more, and then use the stats to back it up. And I think that would be really powerful. The other thing I'll just add is you had a real chance to remind us of the points, not just tell us the points. And that's when using the audience is really, really, really helpful when you say, so point number one was, and you get the audience to repeat it back to you. Point number two was, and then the audience are more likely to remember it because they've said it out loud. Yeah? yeah. So just those things. I meant to do that and I forgot, that's actually. Right. But it's a really good <laughs> yeah. It's okay. It's a really good talk. This, that's for me, is your stretch. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Great stuff. Good. Thanks, Olivia. Anik, have you got any feedback? Yes, you know what? No, actually. Mm -hmm. But you know what I found so amazing? I've heard Hazel speak a, no, a number of times now, and I know normally it's her personal story. So you just use like a different structure. But something clicked for me because if, like, some of you know that, but we are a speaker agency as well, and for some reason we have a lot of finance companies as clients, and I can make a connection tomorrow for you, which I think will get you in front of the right corporates. Because what you did here, I was just sitting there thinking, wow, my women in finance would love that. You know, it was really, really, really amazing. And I love, again, everyone is so structured today. It's shocking. Um, <laughs> only stretch would be, and I think maybe we have to do this all together and maybe then share it in the Facebook group, this story with the frog. I love that story. I've heard it before. By the way, no frogs were harmed in but, the preparation of this talk. I tell you what, if you have people like my husband in your life, I told that story once, and then he's like, here, yeah, Annie, read, this story is not true. The frog isn't stupid. The frog jumps out before he boils. Um, so I don't know. Have a look, because I think this is one of those things that gets like over years people tell that story, and I think it's actually untrue. So, but I love it, and you know, she made us laugh, like talking about it, that was really good. But can we all, do me a favor, because I might forget, research and let me know if it's true or not. It is an urban myth, but it I just think it be, makes a great it story. It true as well, you know, but it was great, and I feel... I'll a frog tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I think the key thing is if you put the lid on the saucepan, yeah. the frog don't get out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> put the lid on. But you know what, you, was, you can see this tonight as well, like, you know, people have different target audiences and I can really now see like this corporate you know um, clientele can really be your niche because you fit in there so beautifully with your corporate experience as well you know and that was really cool good job thank you Lovely. thank you